everybody. Welcome to the beginning of the new series of the Tuesday evening lecture series where we have distinguished painters and practitioners, sculptors and the like who come and talk about their passions of their major activity. We're very pleased this evening to have Carmen Cicero, a very distinguished painter whose works are in the collection ranging from the Brooklyn Museum, the Metropolitan, a recipient of major awards like the Guggenheim uh, Award and many other distinguished uh, areas that uh, mark his career. So uh, Mr. Cicero is going to talk about his own work this evening. We're very pleased to have him. So let's welcome him, Carmen Cicero. Take it and hold it in my hand. Can you hear this? Testing, testing. <coughs> okay. Now, <laughs> all right. As I said, not to be taken too seriously. The portrait of the artist as a young man. <laughs> I, I, had, <laughs> I had aspirations to be a uh, concert clarinetist, to uh, be a great musician. My idea soon changed. I became a painter, made a modest success, and moved to elegant Englewood, New Jersey, where <laughs> I lived for eight years in a perpetual state of ennui until one day I came home from a hard day's work and found this, this is, <laughs> uh, uh, this changed my course in life. Uh, I gathered up some brushes, some tubes of paint, some charcoal, and headed to glamorous New York, right down to the Bowery. I acquired a beautiful, customized automobile. I joined the chic of New York by purchasing a pet pig. I call him Botero. And then sampling the great foods and cuisines of New York City, I soon became part of <laughs> the intellectual elite of the city where boy meets girl, can't tell the difference. <clears throat> and finally my first one-man show, the throngs of people appeared. Uh, as the sophisticates came from every corner of the city <laughs> and the critics were astounded. <laughs> Is that uh, Miss Rayner? <clears throat> and finally, uh, fatigued by the overwhelming adulation, I finally sought some refuge in Cape Cod, where I indulged my very uh, great pleasures, such as fishing, playing, showing off, <laughs> and of course, hard work. And as the sun sinks slowly in the west, the artist goes back to New York City, takes his brush, and starts his profession as a noble artist. Okay, <laughs> lights on. <clears throat> Can we, oh, I don't want to start. I'm not going to start yet. I, I want to talk just a little bit before I uh, start showing some of the slides. Uh, 
many what you saw there a moment ago the uh, that wreckage of a uh, of a building that was my studio that actually happened and the uh, it was a very unfortunate thing i i lost uh, some 40 or 50 paintings uh, great uh, works that other artists had given me that uh, were really treasures. Uh, my musical instruments burned down. Uh, literally everything that I own burned to the ground. I had a work uh, given me by Miro. I'll maybe talk about that uh, in, in a moment. <clears throat> Um, then I did go to New York, and I do live on the Bowery, and I started painting again. And when I started to paint, I had great difficulty because I didn't know whether to go backwards, forwards, uh, start from my roots. It was a very trying period, and uh, one in which I had to cope with the notion of not having a lot of money. But at last I got started, and I started with some figurative expressionist work, which was pretty much where I left uh, before the fire, and, uh, and went then on to a kind of a personal surrealism. Uh, the interesting thing about working as f first an abstract expressionist, this was my first work, then a figurative expressionist, and then a kind of surrealist, is that as a, surreal as a surrealist, the creative process is one thing. As a figurative expressionist, the creative process is quite different, and uh, also as an abstract expressionist. As an abstract expressionist, I approach the canvas, or I can't speak for other artists, but I would approach the canvas with no idea in mind. It's a completely spontaneous and uh, pragmatic um, uh, way of dealing with creativity. One color leads to the next color. One shape leads to the next shape. The excitement of this way of painting is the wonder and the um, uh, the excitement of seeing something grow, uh, to see something manifest itself under your eyes, the colors, the shapes, the so forth, the energy of the brush stroke. You're dealing here with um, uh, the plastic elements, with uh, line, form, color. Uh, it's a pu almost purely aesthetic process. With the uh, figurative expressionist painting, which came next, <coughs> The approach was quite different. There are elements that you bring with you from uh, abstract expressionism. That is the notion of, uh, of composition, of, of, uh, of color, and the color having mood in and of itself. But with the, with the figures coming in, then you have an additional problem, and that problem, which is a challenge and very interesting, is to, to bring, the, the, bring the intensity of the color itself uh, and the mood of color in an abstract way. Of course, when you paint a picture, the atmosphere that is created by color in and of itself produces a mood. Now, as a figurative painter, you take or strive to find a way in which you can take color uh, and the mood that you produce from color and put it in phase with the image and the mood that the interaction of the images produce. So you have uh, an additional problem as a figurative um, expressionist painter. I, I don't believe that one form of painting is any more difficult than the other. They're all very difficult. Uh, as a surrealist, and this will be my, the last work that you see, <clears throat> the approach is quite different. Here, um, uh, some kind of image must manifest itself somehow in your mind. Uh, I'm put in mind of that wonderful poem by uh, Wordsworth, The Daffodils, where there's a line in that poem that goes something like this. When off upon my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon the inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. Well, now, sometimes that flash does not occur, and the bliss, 
naturally does not follow. <clears throat> but what one hopes is that a, an image would manifest itself full-blown with the kind of power and interest that motivates you to paint. Again, the same factors, <clears throat> excuse me, the same factors are involved. You have to find color that has uh, the kind of mood that gets in phase with the image. Uh, you have to, the danger with uh, surrealist painting is to over-romanticize. That is always a problem. Uh, you're sitting alone late at night and you begin to romanticize. It's the cold gray dawn that uh, shakes you up and uh, you, that's the best time to look at your work. At least it is for me. <clears throat> Now, when I uh, started with watercolor, which followed all of this, um, I now entered another realm completely. I started with this way of painting only six or seven years ago, and um, it was extremely intimidating. And my reason for starting with watercolor was uh, very materialistic reasons. I simply needed small work. When you see some of my work, particularly the figurative expressionist pictures, which are very big, very aggressive, very, uh, some very violent, these are not, don't attract many collectors. So I needed some very small work. I chose watercolor and uh, I almost gave up, uh, finally realizing that this is kind of painting is for true artists. This is for uh, Winslow Homer. This is for great artists who have trained all their lives. I struggled and worked with it, and through the years I developed a love for this way of painting. <coughs> it's hard to describe. It's, it's, um, with watercolor painting, I can draw from all the art that I've ever made in my life. I can make uh, expressionist work. I can make figurative work. I can make surreal work. And the joy and the passion that I experience from this wonderful medium comes from taking a wonderful snow white piece of arches 140 pound cold press paper, putting it down on my desk, staring at it, sensing the proportions of the, of the paper, uh, just enjoying the beauty of the paper in and of itself, then taking a pencil and starting not knowing what is going to emerge, having no idea. This becomes the excitement of the painting. One line leads to another and a face emerges or a hat or a gun or a, a shape and some psychological uh, process takes place in which uh, a related form emerges, uh, some form that has something to do with the first form. And next thing you know, you have a series of images and these images seem somehow in some way to be connected. I don't understand exactly how. And then the next great delight is, at least for me, is to, I don't wet the entire paper when I paint. I wet just the area that I'm going, specific area that I'm going to paint. So uh, let us say I'm painting a face. I get water and I fill in the area of the face. Then I watch the water sink slowly into this luscious arches paper until it almost disappears. At that point, I have my brush ready with cadmium yellow white and start to paint and watch this beautiful color sink into the paper. And then I touch some emerald green and I always use those beautiful Windsor Newton colors and touch right alongside that beautiful cadmium uh, or that beautiful uh, yellow and watch that green slowly move into the yellow. It is just, I find, an extremely exciting thing to watch or to make uh, the sky in the background, <clears throat> to take uh, an ultramarine blue and uh, uh, an indigo and wet the paper in this small area and strike uh, the, um, <clears throat> the ultramarine blue and then watch it blend into the, uh, the indigo and you make a mistake and your heart starts to beat and you oh, what am I going to do? Soon you learn <clears throat> that in this kind of painting you have to accept the mistakes 
and you capitalize on the mistakes. And if you mis make a mistake in this corner, you harmonize your picture by making another mistake <laughs> in this corner so that you have a surface that has a consistency of expression. The wonderful thing for me about watercolors, as I said, is that you can, or I can, draw from my complete range of imagery. Uh, it, uh, some of the uh, works are very mysterious and somber and haunting. Others are almost comical. Others are um, uh, have those elements of abstract expressionism. Now, what I would like to do is to just show you some samples of my work so that you can see how my work developed from abstract expressionism, and then a few examples of figurative expressionism, then the kind of work that I'm doing on canvas right now, which is a kind of, <clears throat> I call it a kind of existential painting, and I'll talk about that in just a moment, and then into my watercolors. And the watercolors embody and contain elements of all of this work that preceded. And so if we can have the lights, All right. Now, this is an example of the uh, first, uh, this is one of the very earliest works. It's a, I'll just give you the approximate dates and approximate sizes because I don't, really don't remember uh, the sizes. And again, most, when that fire happened, everything I owned burned, including slides, books, uh, everything went to, so I, uh, this is owned by the Newark Museum. It's about five feet along the bottom. It's essentially black and tans and, and so forth. Uh, <coughs> this is a drawing with India ink, and this is about 20 inches across the bottom, about uh, somewhere in the 50s, the early 50s. Uh, and you can almost see a leaning towards, away from abstraction, towards some kind of peculiar imagery. So. <coughs> Uh, again, closer now to imagery, yet some uh, ex still some uh, abstract uh, expressionist uh, elements in the work, uh, but you can see figurative and uh, figure figurative uh, expressionist still. Uh, this is just a reproduction. I don't have any idea what this work is. It's about nine feet across the bottom. It's uh, in black and white. Uh, and again, starting to move towards figurative. Here, this we can see again, closer still. This is, I think this the Whitney owns this. Um, and uh, after this came the fire. And this is the first uh, work, or one of the earliest works after the fire, which was in 1971 or two. <clears throat> this is about eight feet across the bottom. Not a very cheerful picture, but it wasn't a very cheerful fire. So uh, uh, it, it, the color is quite accurate. Um, it's called The Nightmare. Uh, another of this early period, uh, again in the 70s, about eight feet across the bottom, uh, The Battle of the Sexes. I don't know what happened. <coughs> Want to get stuck? about five feet high. Um, it, it probably makes reference, makes reference to my fire, and uh, it's called fire. 
Uh, this is about eight feet. It's called uh, Provincetown Princess. Uh, I think it says what, what it has to say. Uh, the feminist. You can get the scale by looking at the uh, electrical connection there to the left. It's about, I would guess, about eight feet in height. Pretty accurate, the coloration here. Uh, crime, a grotesque figure emerging from the canvas, firing a weapon. Uh, again, death egging on a criminal. This is a theme that occurs over and over again in my work. Again, by the size of the telephone, you can see the scale of the picture. This is uh, Mr. Ghost Goes to Town, probably kind of a self-portrait. Uh, after the fire, uh, there was a strange combination of being very ecstatic and excited and so forth, and yet the sense of death hovering uh, around and about me. I think the fire uh, had an effect of uh, my realizing uh, the possibilities of leaving this earth. <clears throat> and so we have this very grim and ecstatic ghost. This is when I was running around New York like a madman. <clears throat> And now again we have the battle of the sexes, but now we have more sexes. We have uh, homosexuals and women and men and everything in between. This is about eight feet long. Oh, this is sort of interesting. I made this painting, it's about eight feet long, and I put this in the picture. I have a fascination with the uh, myth of Dracula. So, <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> now, I, I, this is the way it is at the present moment, and I'm thinking of putting this back in. <laughs> I should ask for votes, you know. <laughs> I'm beginning to like that guy. <clears throat> now, this is interesting. I look at myself, I can't ever believe I was that young. <clears throat> but this is one of the pictures that was burned in the fire. I had some 40 or 50 pictures like this, and as far as I know, I don't know anyone who was doing this sort of work at the time, because this was in the early 60s. A friend of mine sent this uh, slide to me, and uh, I, I treasure it because well, this work does not exist. And here is another slide that he sent, and this wooded back wall, see the wall back there, that's what burned down. And this is a slide that someone sent to me, which uh, is a painting called Miss America. Uh, I have no idea where it is. I think it burned down, but I'm not sure. <clears throat> and this is uh, Looking Back, the work that the North Museum has. It's one of my favorites. It's, uh, it's probably the a quintessential Bowery painting. I'll tell you, there are, were nights in February when uh, I looked down from my fourth floor window down on the Bowery in the streets with, uh, and st you could see some very strange things happening on that street. Very peculiar, very lonely, very bleak. Uh, it is becoming gentrified now, but when I first moved there, it was a quite uncomfortable place, a little scary. <clears throat> And I think this is a wonderful example of how I felt and many others walking up and down the street. <clears throat> um, this work, it's called Death Hails a Cab. Uh, the sun is coming up and this image of death, he's waiting for his last victim for the night. He's in a state of glee, loves his work. Um, Somehow this, I feel, led to some of the more surreal work that I did later um, and to the existential attitude that I began to develop was that strange and curious phenomena happened around us, but somehow we began to develop a non-judgmental, detached view 
of what we see and that life passes on and seems to have no meaning. Uh, and these attitudes, I think they come in upon us as we get older. <coughs> and another example of the more surreal atmosphere entering the work. And this, again, um, I began to love the notion of um, a peculiar, uh, a strange, mystical, um, s um, disquieting uh, atmosphere where there are no witnesses to the scene. And yet something is very uh, peculiar and dramatic is taking place. Uh, you can almost feel the motor humming and the uh, <coughs> and not being able to penetrate into the car and wondering what is going on and feels like it's about four o'clock in the morning on a bitter February day. Uh, I began to be fascinated by this whole theme and this whole idea. This is a very peculiar. <laughs> I gave this to my dentist for some dental work and I, <coughs> I deeply regret it. <laughs> Uh, and it's a theme that I later uh, uh, developed, and you'll see in a moment. <clears throat> oh, this is very interesting. Um, this is directly from a dream. I, uh, when I was a young man, I lived in the city of New York, and in the summertime, I used to love to play with bands and go away for the summer, and there were times when I didn't go away for the summer, and I stayed in the city of New York, and this is when it was a very quiet, pleasant little town and uh, there were those days in the middle of the summer where you would walk through the city on these very hot days very 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 lonely very uncomfortable the loneliness and I retained that image uh, uh, into my adult life and I had a dream which and this I simply painted the dream as I saw it, and this is it. I didn't think anyone could actually uh, identify with this painting, but I found that people did, and they sensed the loneliness of it and the surreal, disquieting atmosphere. Again, it has that uh, existential uh, appearance. <coughs> I made, again, this is a recent uh, uh, painting of the same theme. Uh, this is about six feet long. This to me is the absolute quintessential existential picture. What it is, when I look at it, 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 is, a, it is a picture of exactly the way I feel when I'm looking at the world with that non-judgmental look, with the notion that uh, nothing really matters that much, life will pass by, You'll be gone, the world will continue along. <laughs> and uh, uh, <clears throat> not very uh, happy feeling. As I said, as you get older in life, sometimes these feelings do emerge. I think most, most people have this on occasion. This is a picture of that. And this is the interesting thing about this painting. It, I painted the background. I was exper experimenting with stained canvas, uh, washes and so forth. Uh, and I'd gotten this from painting with watercolor. And I just put the painting on the wall and stared at it week after week after week. And this is an instant of, it flashed upon the inward eye. I saw the image clearly in my head, the size, the shape, the stare. And I started with the left ear and without making any drawing, just taking a brush, I just painted the picture exactly as I saw it in my mind. <clears throat> Another one of my later paintings, these very disquieting, uh, strange atmosphere kinds of pictures, very lonely. The car, I always think of that sort of, I guess, as myself passing through life. <clears throat> And again, I re went back to the boat that we saw earlier, one of these scenes where no one is observing and a dramatic situation is taking place. I tried then to uh, make a picture in which there was no storytelling in the picture to see if I could capture the quiet, disquieting, surreal atmosphere. 
uh, and the only anomaly might be was that blue line. Uh, the picture is about six feet long. Uh, hopeful, I, it touches me in that strange way. Again, uh, another scene that takes place. No one sees it. Very quiet. Uh, this reminds me very much of a Joseph Conrad story or a scene from a Joseph Conrad story. I've had it in my mind for a very, very long time and I struggle with it. Uh, and I finally have, I finally captured it. Uh, and it fits perfectly into the line of work that I'm presently doing. <coughs> and here's that car again. <laughs> it's getting gray. Uh, this is a picture, uh, it's Sicily. Um, it's just, again, the same disquieting atmosphere, still. And here's the car again. Actually, this image came from my watercolors. Not so much, I made a painting with watercolor, and then I backtracked and painted this picture, which is about six feet long. Uh, I think this image comes from a motion picture that I saw years and years and years ago of a car going through a lonely wood. The image just stayed with me. There's something about it that I find very intriguing. <clears throat> oh, this is, um, this is the last painting I made. It's a very poor slide because it has color in it, very dull color. It's called Tracer of Lost Persons. Uh, it's an, an endless road. Again, a scene, uh, a very surreal, disquieting scene that no one is privy to. It's taking place, but no one sees it. Now, uh, this is the background, and now the next pictures are my watercolors. <clears throat> As I said, the first watercolor uh, of the car uh, rather, the first image was from one of my watercolors. And this is it. The, the, the idea of being so loose and free, and if you make a mistake, it's not a tragedy. You can throw it away. It's, uh, I just find it a wonderful way to work. All kinds of images. This is the Mad Baron. I became fascinated with using browns as part of my palette. I find them extremely difficult to mix, at least to find the right kind of brown. It's, I, I mix them from scratch, and I find that they just do something wonderful in the picture. They, particularly, I love the idea of brown to yellow and brown to yellow and brown to orange. There's something about those colors that have a warm and... Uh, uh, well, I like the warmth on the inside and the coolness on the outside. <coughs> Here we have the figurative expressionist images. Uh, this theme happens again and again. The uh, somewhat seduc seductive woman and the suspicious man on the, <laughs> the outside. Uh, the Emperor of Ice Cream. This is from a poem by uh, Wallace Stevens. It's coffee ice cream. <laughs> uh, again, oh, this is from, um, this idea came from an old film that I saw years ago, The Werewolf of London, where uh, the werewolf, in order to cure himself, must have this flower that only blooms at night called the Marifesa. And the idea of the fl white flower blooming at night was very intriguing, and so I made a, a series of uh, watercolors with this theme. <coughs> ah, back to Provincetown. Just sitting, thinking, daydreaming. Uh, it's so wonderful to just have these images and so quickly just to capture them and put them down. Again, uh, though there's a great disparity in the imagery, somehow the fact that they're paint, that's painted in watercolor legitimizes it some way, and you seem to have a flow and a continuum uh, with a great disparity of imagery. And here we have that existential look. Now here's the tracer of lost persons. The first image, the first painting was a watercolor painting. And the 
the larger work that you saw previously came from this <coughs> from this watercolor. It's one of my favorites. Uh, Cape Cod again. This is the uh, I think. Uh, I think this is the artist in an ecstatic, sublime mood, enjoying the wonderful night in Provincetown. You can see the tower in the back and the moonlight and the water and those wonderful, happy evenings. <coughs> and it's just a touch of surrealism here. This is the opposite of the man <laughs> in a state of ecstasy. <laughs> This are those mornings when you get up and uh, want to go back to bed again. <clears throat> it speaks for itself. Oh yes, this. Uh, oh, a collector bought this, and he insisted that I explain what all of this means, <clears throat> uh, which I cannot do. Uh, and uh, he almost became angry because I couldn't offer a, an explanation of these images and what the psychological significance was. I think about the, uh, the present day deconstructionists, those uh, critics that look at works and they have answers for all the imagery that they see. I think what, real, what they're really doing is deconstructing themselves and revealing their own psychology and their own politics and projecting these thoughts onto the pictures. And I, uh, as far as interpreting it myself, I find that a very risky business. I don't know where these images come from, but there they are. Here he is, very menacing. Again, I love that uh, brown going to the yellow. Not a very good photograph, but that's, this is a, um, this is, I start working with a slightly larger format. This is probably, uh, most of what you've seen is a uh, 30 by 22 format. This is probably um, maybe 40 inches across the bottom. That's a rainbow maiden. It's 32 by, or 30 by 22, a standard uh, arches paper. And here we are, daydream again. Oh, now, at this point, I began to experiment with very, very large watercolors. This watercolor is five feet across the bottom. I got very excited being able to make uh, very bold images this way. And I have a few. No, that goes back to the smaller format. And this is, again, the smaller format, the women and the, uh, it's like Suzanne and the elders, I think. Oh, this is just a little fantasy, star man. Again, the uh, flower in the moonlight. These peculiar images that I don't understand. This is a, a uh, probably 22 by 30. Uh -uh. Oh, oh, wait a minute. No, there's something. Something's missing. Uh, there are some pictures missing. Oh, wait a minute. They're on the other. Uh, I have a few more here. I, I started to become very involved with painting oversized watercolor. So the next watercolors you see will be about five feet across the bottom for the most part. And what I've done is to bring a couple of, no, this is not one of them yet, but I'll show you in a moment. Yes, this is five feet across the bottom. And it's that theme of the death egging on the criminal and the uh, woman who is the victim of some kind of rage here. And that the uh, love for that, I love those browns, just became intrigued by them. Uh, this is also five feet across the bottom. I have some samples of that work, which I have right here. And right after this, these next few, I'm going to show you some of these works, some of the originals. 
That's five feet across the, up the side. <clears throat> I was very, it was very interesting to see when I finished this picture that that looked like Picasso. And it looked like Picasso and some of his friends. Again, it's 60, uh, 60 inches across the bottom. And here we have Dracula gazing down upon his victim. And this is one of, harking back to that theme of the automobile, the disquieting atmosphere, the scene that no one sees. And now this is the last picture. And what I would like to do now is have the lights go on and I'm going to show you the actual original work which I have right here. So just hold on a moment. <laughs> from the tube, and I wet the paper, and I try to get the paint at the highest intensity possible, because I just, I can't tell you how I love the surface of this paper when the color sinks in, and, it, it, the, and you see the texture of the paper through it. It just looks so, it just looks as delicious as ice cream. I have, now here is, you saw this work, here is, I have the same work that you saw on the slide, and here I'm using much more delicate colors, and you can see the surface better. I just love the <laughs> surface. I can't tell you how much. Uh, when I'm when I'm when I'm at Cape Cod, my greatest delight is to either get a book on tape, one of the great books on tapes, put that on, go out on my porch with a screened in porch, listen to the birds sing, get out my watercolors, <laughs> and paint all day long. Either that or listen to a symphony or listen to uh, Kenny Barron, the great jazz musician. Great. And here is the I thought this was no good, and a friend came over and he says, hey, that's good. So I said, let me reevaluate this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, if any of you have any questions, technical questions, aesthetic questions, um, well, all I can say is that it's arched. This the paper I use mostly is standard size, which is 30 by 22. It's cold pressed. That means it's not shiny, and it, it, uh, it has this very dry, beautiful surface, and it just takes the paint. Well, what I do is I cut out a piece of plywood and I put it just larger than this and so that I can stick the paper on just with tacks and then I can tilt it up when the paint is dry and take a look at it now and then and put it down again. It's nothing you tricky use, about it. You use foam core too. No, I just put it on, the, on, on, on a piece of plywood. Any other questions? Yes? Well, you said at one point that you, you've gone to watercolor you needed smaller works, but I noticed that you're going to head back into oil paint. 
this tells you what a fool I am. That's all. <laughs> now, I started out specifically because I needed, for practical reasons, smaller work. And then I simply became fascinated by the medium. And I became more grandiose as I worked, and work got bigger and bigger and bigger. And so, here it is. <laughs> Any other? Yes? Yeah, you said that um, you liked your, your favorite one was the Van Warfare Carson Bridge. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. And the things that you didn't like the Dracula one, the things that didn't. Well, I don't know. The, 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 uh, the Dracula, when I finished painting it, it looked a little bit clumsy to me. And, uh, and I guess I was very fascinated uh, with this existential notion about painting. People doing things that were unseen and doing things which seemed to have no meaning. And this idea of, I think we all feel this way, particularly being redundant as we get older and we see, uh, you know, the end of the tunnel, <laughs> uh, you begin to wonder about life and what it means and if, if it means anything. And, you know, when you pass over the edge, uh, what does it all mean? Huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> you wouldn't understand it. But at any rate, I had a fascination with this and that particular <coughs> image and the image of the dog, these two seem to be the essence of what I was feeling. That's why I have such a strong feeling for them. Um, one thing it was called Miss America. I yes. Yes. I'm just wondering why you named them those names. Well, <clears throat> uh, you paint a I don't. I didn't start painting them with any notion in mind. And when you get, I got finished painting them, and uh, the one that I called Miss America, I think it had some red, white, and blue in it and it was a female figure. So I called it Miss America. The feminist, it, it, it wasn't even a woman when I first started. It was just uh, searching and drawing and so forth, and the head emerged, and some feet emerged, and so forth and so on. And it's, the woman is holding up a look, appears to be a banner in one hand, and a phallic symbol in the other. So I said, this, <laughs> I'll call this the feminist. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me any more questions on that. <laughs> any other questions? Yes. Do you uh, always, and the watercolors, do you always pencil in the image first? Do you draw it in with the Yes, brush? yes. With the watercolors, it's different than the uh, figurative expressionist pictures. The figurative expressionist pictures, it's so to speak, search and find. You're kind of drawing and so forth. You don't know what's going to emerge. The thrill of the watercolors for me is to take that pencil, look at a sheet of white paper, and then hit the paper with your pencil and start to draw, and suddenly you've got a funny looking hat, and then you've got a face, and then you've got an arm, it's got a pistol in it, and then, and to watch this emerge right under your eye, and it just, uh, since, since you don't know when you're going to make a mistake, you don't know when you're going to fail, you have this excitement. This is a constant discovery and a constant excitement. This is the thrill for me of uh, watercolor. It suits my uh, creative spirit. I'm a jazz saxophone player and uh, I'm an improviser. I love to improvise. Uh, the thrill of improvising is not knowing what's going to happen. This sustains you. This sustains your excitement. So I have a history of painting with all kinds of images. I have all kinds of images passing through my head. And I, any of those things can emerge at any moment when I start to paint. And I have a nice stack of watercolor paper right there. If I make a mistake, I just take that one, throw it away. With a painting, oh, you have a big commitment. <laughs> this is a, 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 where it's just a very thrilling to work uh, this format. <laughs> any other questions? Okay. <clears throat>